Good evening, everybody. Very, very warm welcome to you all um, to this very special evening. Uh, I'm delighted we'll be joined and are joined on screen now by Professor Robert Waldinger from Harvard Medical School. Uh, Bob, it's lovely to see you again. Thank you so much for being here, first of all. It's lovely to be here in a, on an afternoon in Boston. Well, welcome. And I can see already we have thousands of people who've joined us on this uh, Zoom webinar and there'll be many more watching live on, on Facebook too. So a, a very warm welcome to all of you who've, um, who've joined us this evening. Um, this evening's event is entitled Happier Together and we will come on to this idea that I think is um, that, that, that Bob has done so much wonderful work on uh, around the importance of our relationships for our happiness. But we're going to have a more expansive conversation than that this evening and touch on a range of themes to do with happiness and living a good life, but to do with our connections with each other and how we can build a better world together. It's incredibly topical right now with all the challenges the world is facing. Uh, and Bob really has a unique perspective on this whole topic through the amazing study that he is director of um, which has been following the lives of people for, I think, 75 years now. I'll let Bob say more about it. We have this amazing insight into what is it that predicts a good life. And I'm looking forward to exploring that with you, Bob, uh, this evening. So before um, I hand over to you and we get started, just to give people who are joining now a bit of a sense of what's in store, we're going to start, as you've kindly offered, to lead us in a bit of a, a meditation exercise to help us tune into how we're feeling about all this right now and to maybe allow us to deal with some of the things that we're all dealing with. It's a difficult time for many people right now. So we'll start with a moment of pause and reflection. And then I'm just gonna um, guide us through a few uh, themes and topics, which I know you have great expertise on and I, I hope will be of great interest to the audience as well, looking at you know, what, what, what creates our happiness, but also relationships, the current situation in the world, some of the challenges we face and maybe ways that we can put all this into action for ourselves and our own lives, but also for the people we care about. So really looking forward to getting your perspectives on that. And then of course, folks tuning in, there'll also be time for your questions. So um, you'll see if you're, if you're new to Zoom, have a look down and you'll see there's a, a Q and A option on screen. Um, and so if you do want to pose a question, unfortunately we definitely won't have time to take all of your questions but we'd love to put some of the, the questions live to Bob this evening and we'll leave time for that. And I can already see that hundreds of people are, uh, are joining in on the chat function as part of Zoom. So do, if you'd like to get involved with that, there's always a lovely conversation in these webinars, but equally, if you're finding it distracting, please feel free to, to close the chat window on your device so that you can focus on what Bob is sharing with us. So uh, we, we have a, a great turnout already. I can see thousands have joined us. So I'll leave the introduction there and, and really invite you, Bob, to, to, to get us set for this evening's conversation, really. Um, you've kindly offered to lead us in a, a meditation. Maybe you'd like to introduce that in whatever way seems most appropriate to you. I'm happy to. Uh, first of all, it is a thrill to be here. And watching all the chatting that's going on is pretty exciting. It's a reflection of this community that I'm learning more and more about uh, in Action for Happiness. So really great to be here. So I, uh, I am a Zen practitioner. I have practiced Zen now for many years, meditation. I teach Zen. And it's been a hugely helpful part of my life. But I think for many of us, it's not obvious why paying attention uh, to the present moment, which is what meditation is, why that would be helpful. And so what I thought I would do, if you are willing, is to ask you to join me in a meditation exercise that might just help give you a taste of what I'm talking about, um, of how, how actually paying attention in the present moment could relieve suffering right now. So first, here's my challenge. Would you all be willing to shut off the chat function right now, just for a minute, because I don't want you to have any other distractions. Now, obviously that's completely voluntary, but if you would, uh, because we're 
constantly giving each other partial attention. And so I'm wondering if you'd be willing to come into full attention with me right now and then do this exercise with me and then you can go right back to chatting or whatever you want to do. So here's the exercise. I'd like you to sit comfortably where you are and if you're comfortable with it, close your eyes. If you're not comfortable with that, it's fine to leave your eyes open. Sit very still and think about something that's recently been bothering you. Think about a worry or something that angered you or somebody who annoyed you or perhaps somebody who hurt you or something really upsetting in our world that's gotten to you personally. Think about that for a moment. Let yourself feel it. Let the thoughts really swirl and develop and let the feelings just come up. And now I'd like you to let those upsetting thoughts be there. Don't push them away. Let the upsetting feelings be there. Don't try to stop them. And now expand your awareness to include how your body feels. Notice what breathing in feels like and breathing out. Notice if you're having any muscle tension right now and where that is. You might hear the sound of blood pulsing through your ears. Notice any physical sensation that comes to you. So now, Again, don't push the upsetting thoughts and feelings away, but expand your awareness a second time. So the thoughts may still be there and you're aware of some body sensations and now include any sounds that there might be in the room or the feel of the air on your skin, or the sound of traffic outside, or birds. Whatever sounds and feelings reach you. So now what I'd like you to do is notice the difference between those upsetting thoughts and feelings when we began and how they seem to you now. And now if your eyes were closed, please open them. So what we did was we just started with where our minds are most of our waking lives. We're thinking about worries, we're thinking about plans, what's wrong, what's vexing, and sometimes what's happy and what's pleasurable. But we as humans typically focus on the content of our minds to almost the total exclusion of everything else. Think of the times, for example, that you've been lost in thought as you've been traveling to a familiar destination, to the office or to a friend's house, that we're so often on autopilot. So this moving through life on autopilot, 
endlessly involved with our internal monologue is a large part of what makes us feel trapped in our own skulls. So what I did just now is I deliberately asked you to focus on something that was unpleasant because those things are especially riveting. They draw our attention. And then I asked you to expand your awareness to your body, to tune into those sensations that are always there and available to us, breathing, heartbeat, but that we typically screen out. It's a whole humming, vibrating, ever-changing universe of experience that mostly we screen out. And then finally, I asked you to expand your awareness to what's around you, to the room, to the sounds that might be outside. So now, if those vexing, troubling thoughts and feelings that you started with are still there, they're not occupying center stage in quite the same way. And life feels bigger than that particular problem that I got you to start thinking about. What we did was to decenter from the content of our thoughts. We don't push thinking away. We don't try to get rid of thoughts or feelings. In fact, the more you try to get rid of anything going through your mind, the more your mind will be abuzzed with thinking about that. We just expanded our awareness to include more and more of what's present right here in the moment. There's an analogy to this that I like a lot. It's like taking a teaspoon of salt and putting it in a teacup full of water and mixing it up. And if you do that, the water tastes very salty. But then if you pour that teacup full of water into a gallon of water and mix it up, the water tastes much less salty. And then if you did the same thing again and poured that gallon of water into a bathtub full of water and tasted that water, you would hardly taste the salt at all. It's the same amount of salt. It's the same amount of trouble and upset, but no longer taking over most of our awareness. And that's how paying attention in the moment and expanding awareness can relieve suffering right here, right now, in any moment, always available to us. So thank, thank you for letting me take you through that. Now you're free to turn on the chat function again if you want, um, but hopefully you'll also spend some time uh, talking with Mark and me about what we'd like to share with you. Well, thank you, Bob. That was a very moving exercise. I found that incredibly helpful and it did indeed alleviate uh, a cause of anxiety for me currently and putting it sort of into context of, of what else is going on around me. Um, I'd like to bring us from that really lovely centering and beginning of this chat to, to really invite you to share perhaps the, the central thesis of your work which some of the audience will have seen in your amazing TED talk that's reached millions of people. Um, but I wondered if you wanted to share, you know, a little bit of the context about the amazing study you've been doing following people's lives and perhaps some of the most important messages that have come out of that. Sure. This, this is, as far as we know, the longest study of adult life that's ever been done. And what's so unusual is that it followed the same people from the time they were teenagers all the way into old age. Almost all of them have passed away now. And we've been studying their children, and we hope to study their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But these original people um, were 724 men. About two-thirds of them were from Boston's poorest, most disadvantaged families. And about one-third were among the most privileged group they could find back then in 1938, a group of uh, Harvard College sophomores, so second year students. And we followed all of them um, all the way through their lives and asked them periodically to share the most important things about their mental health, their physical health, their work lives, their family lives, their friendships, their community involvement. So that's what we did. 
And as far as we know, it's the longest study that's ever been done. And the, oh yes, yeah, so you asked Mark uh, to share some well, of the- Well, I guess, the, I guess lots of us think about, we know what would lead to a good life, but we think that if you have the right, you know, education, the right income, the right things, the right success, yeah. the right sort of external achievements, that would lead to a good life. Is that what you found? Yeah, well, no, not exactly. I mean, what we did find was that having your basic needs met is vital. Right, so having a roof over your head, being able to feed yourself and your family, uh, having health care, all of that is really important. But that once that is taken care of, then, you know, more money, uh, becoming famous, becoming super powerful at work, um, that just, uh, that doesn't seem to increase happiness much at all. And that what we found, the most consistent thing we found all the way through was that the strength of people's friendships and relationships with other people was the strongest factor in keeping people not just happier emotionally, but physically healthier. And that was actually the big surprise. I mean, it stands to reason that if you have happy relationships, you'll be happier. How could it actually keep people healthier? How could it keep you from getting heart disease or from developing type two diabetes or arthritis? How could that happen? So we've been studying that now for the last 15, 20 years. So powerful stuff and, and really insightful. Um, I guess it, it, it takes me towards the situation we're finding ourselves in currently in the world um, Bob, so, you know, I think your, your, your work has found that uh, relationships are really important for a, a good life and, and togetherness and, and that sense of feeling connected to others. And yet here we are in a, in a global crisis that's affecting the whole human family where people are really struggling in many ways. We're socially isolating that awful term of sort of being distant from each other. There are many people who are shielding and staying away. Um, what are some of your reflections on, you know, how the, the, the findings of your work and particularly around the importance of relationships play out in this very difficult situation we're in at the moment? It's such an important issue for all of us. And what I'm finding, both from our research and from just talking with people and from my own family and friends, is that um, our lives have been frozen suddenly. We've been frozen in place in a way so that we can't connect with some of the people that we're used to being able to see every day or every week, whenever we want to. Um, those people we see at work or those friends we go for a drink with after work or, or play sports with. So we can't see those people. And at the same time, we're home 24-7 with people who we don't usually stay home with all the time. Uh, School-age children who we're used to sending off to school every day or to childcare. We're not with our spouses or our significant others every day, 24 seven. In fact, we never signed up for that. I mean, most of us, when we got together with our partners, didn't say, I'll be with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week for weeks on end. We never did that. So. So I think what, what we're seeing is both enforced isolation and separation from people who we need and want to be with, and then also some enforced contact, sometimes without enough of a break. And I'd be happy to talk to each of those things if that would be of use, Mark, or, you know, uh, but, I, but I'm finding that there are these kind of two extremes that, that we, we need to think about and manage. Well, I think that's your observations are very well taken. And I think there were so many challenges coming out of this situation. I wonder if perhaps we might move towards looking at what some of the ways we can enhance our connections and relationships are. And then maybe we could revisit how that's particularly applicable or challenging right now. So perhaps maybe stepping away from the crisis for a moment, what would you say um, in your experience and in the, again, looking at the studies you've done are some of the most important ways that we can you know, in, in recognizing that our relationships really drive lifelong health and happiness, 
what more can we do to cultivate good relationships in general terms? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I always used to think was that uh, relationships would just kind of take care of themselves. So I made a friend or I got together with a partner and then we were all set, right? And they would, they would just go on like that. And what we've learned in our research and what other research shows us is that actually relationships don't just take care of themselves, that they require constant tending and nurturing. So very common that really good relationships, let's say marriages, for example, um, are off to a good start and then the kids come along and then the couple is a good tag team and they take care of the kids, but they actually don't spend any time together anymore. And they start being more of a, a you know, a work team rather than uh, an, an intimate relationship. Similarly with friends where people find that as they get older, those friends you made, those childhood friends or those friends from school, uh, with, they fall away not because there's anything wrong in the friendships, but because we don't actively make the time to tend to them. We don't call each other up. We don't say in the, in the non-pandemic times, we don't say, let's get together for coffee. Uh, let's go take a walk together. We just don't do that. We say, well, I'm going to spend time this afternoon doing my email because I need to get it done. So I think what we've been learning from our research is that there is there's something I, I like to call social fitness. It's almost like physical fitness where you don't say, well, I worked out today, so I'm done. I don't need to work out ever again. That, that when we think about tending to relationships, they need it, we need to really think about, well, which friends am I not seeing? And, and who do I want to be in touch with? And, and what do I want to do this Saturday afternoon? Do I want to spend my time on my computer or do I want to call up a friend and take a walk? Even a socially distanced walk with masks on is possible. So, so what I guess my, my, that's a long answer to saying that actively taking the initiative to attend to relationships is, is the way to keep them vibrant and to keep good relationships from becoming stale. Mm, indeed and you mentioned this idea of social distancing i find that term um frustrating in some ways because what of course we want is physical distancing to keep our health risks at bay during the crisis but we want to stay socially connected and uh, my colleague <laughs> vanessa king our our psychology expert did a lovely uh, webinar so it's a live stream earlier talking about uh, listening as a, as a vital sort of way of staying connected and you know, heartfelt listening and really connecting with people. Have you found that, is that an example, do you think, of some of what you talked about, sort of actively cultivating relationships that we actually need to be better at hearing each other? Absolutely. That's a great, that is a great point. Because, you know, if you think about it, just to ask people, what's this been like for you? Um, you know, what's it been like to be by yourself alone in your flat or your, your house, right? Or what's it been like to have your kids home all day long? Or what's it like to be without childcare? And I think that, that to, so just to ask people, tell me about your experience is a way for, to help people feel more connected and then to tell them about your experience. And that we can do, you know, we can do here on Zoom um, or we can do taking a walk. And, and I like that point. It's, we don't want social distancing. We want physical distancing we, as we need it for health reasons, but we don't want to be socially distanced at all. Physically uh, safe, but socially connected. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I, I guess you, you touched on already about the idea of asking somebody, especially if they're in a difficult situation, they're feeling uh, lonely, isolated at home. Of course, there are many people not only struggling right now in the crisis, but also that might feel quite disconnected generally. I mean, it's not all of us that have the luxury of uh, a loving spouse or partner, uh, family at home. There are many people, in, in fact, increasing numbers of people living alone, feeling lonely, disconnected, and people who may not be extroverted, may not naturally want to form a lot of face-to-face -face connections. Are, are there ways in which you can still help people cultivate good relationships, even if they're feeling a bit sort of socially isolated? Yes, yes. 
one way is that we can help those people. So we all know people who are socially isolated and they may not be reaching out to us either because they're more isolated and they tend not to do that or because they can't for some reason. So when you think of somebody who you think may be more alone than they want to be, reach out to them. If the thought crosses your mind, do something about it. And don't think I'll do that later, unless it's three in the morning, in which case do that later. But, but other than that, reach out, take that moment when the thought occurs to you. And then I think for the people who are more alone now, if you can, some of us feel more comfortable than others, just reaching out and saying, hi, how are you? Uh, and there are kind of low threshold ways to do that now where you could just send a quick text or a quick email and, and send it to everybody you can think of and then see who comes back to you. Um, so there are some, uh, it doesn't even take a lot of courage to send an email or write a text for many people in the way that it might take to, to make a call on the telephone if you're not sure you're gonna catch somebody at a good time. So I think that the, the encouragement for people who are alone is to try to reach out, but then the encouragement for those of us who know them is to really be active in reaching out to them. Thank you, very, very wise words, uh, Bob. So this sort of leads, I think, into a broader question for me about the, the situation we find ourselves in collectively, not just in this current crisis, but with the, the, some of the trends we're seeing in society. Uh, there's almost sort of two competing narratives about humans and how we are together. There's one that's very much about a common humanity. We're all in this together. And actually one of the rather encouraging things at the start of the crisis, at least, was a sense of, right, we're facing a common threat all this lovely outpouring of kindness, people getting in WhatsApp groups in their communities, a newfound sense of togetherness. And yet on the other hand, we have and have had for some years now, uh, increasingly in the West, a sort of sense of a, a more polarized way of being, an us versus them. Uh, yeah. If you're either in my in-group or you're not, There's that sort of sense of animosity. And of course, as we're coming out of this crisis, people have different levels of tolerance for risk. Some people are very gung-ho, some people are very nervous, and we're starting to feel a little bit like uh, an us and them narrative is is creeping back in. So I guess both both in the current context, but also more generally, how important is it that we do nurture that narrative of togetherness? And what can we do to sort of bring that out more at a time of increasing uh, sort of polarization of, of different groups? I think that is like the central question for all of us right now. You know, if we look at how we humans have done throughout the course of history, when we divide ourselves off from each other, we end up suffering. We make wars on each other, we, we demonize each other, we cause a lot of hurt. And when we recognize the fact that we are really all in this together, we're all on this planet together, we're all in this pandemic together, then cooperation is possible, then there's few, less infection, fewer people die. We're, we're able to open up our societies again sooner. Like all that happens if we pull together and we pull in a united way. So actually the fragmentation and the division has gotten in the way of exactly the thing that people are most upset about and say they need, which is to be back having their freedoms again. The more we pull together, the, more, the, more we, the sooner we'll be able to have those freedoms. So, so I guess my, my urging uh, is that anytime someone tries to divide us from each other, we turn away from those messages. And anytime somebody uses language and speaks to us about being in this together and acting that way, those are the people we want to turn toward and those are the people we want to listen to. And we really do have a choice there. That's, that's very wise advice uh, and something that's very actionable because I think we can often feel that visceral response to is this creating a sort of toxic uh, interaction or a sort of constructive way of responding. I was very moved by something you said in your TED talk actually in, in the context of personal relationship but it was about how people who have sort of generally loving and nurturing 
um, relationships are sort of that's protective for their health. If you're in a sort of, I think what you call a high conflict relationship where there's more animosity and so on, that's just generally detrimental for, for, for health and in a sort of very predictive way. Presumably that's also true at a societal level. Is that right that our sort of the more um, sort of toxic interactions we have, it's, it's bad for all of our well-being? Is that your observation? Absolutely, absolutely. And I can say this as a uh, clinician, as a psychiatrist, that people, people who I have seen for a long time are coming in more upset, more stressed, and starting to have more physical health problems. Um, even though the stresses are not primarily from, say, within their, their families or their individual worlds, it is the stress of the environment now that's taking a toll on all of us. Um, and so what I would say is that we are all going to be physically healthier the more we calm down this inflammation of our differences. Um, and that's easy to, unfortunately, we humans have this quality to our minds that it's easy to get us all excited about our differences and help us find enemies. That's just the way we're built. So we have to kind of actively counter that. But the health the health benefits are very clear of reducing the stress that comes with social divisions. So here's a challenge uh, to that and that we might experience for those of us that really care about this mission, which is there are many things in our world we want to put right. We might be passionate about the climate change challenge or uh, you know, racial injustice or so, some, some other societal you know, uh, situation that needs to be rectified. We're angry, we, we want to see change. So how can we use those desires to change and make things better that are coming from a good place but do involve an anger and a, and a sort of confrontational nature in a constructive way, bearing in mind all that you've said? How can we be both compassionate and connected but also to stand up for what we believe in? Right, right. So I just want to call out a, a, quote, a famous quote from the Buddha. Uh, he said, you know, 2,500 years ago, he said, hate never quelled hate. Only love quells hate. So I am passionate about uh, saving our planet. I care deeply about that. And I know that there are people who think that that's all a hoax and not something we need to worry about. And that it's far more important to worry about our economy. Um, and the fact is that we have to find ways where it doesn't become either or. Uh, we have to find ways where we take care of people who are suffering as we work for climate change and we shut down coal mines. So if we do that, we have to take care of coal miners and their families. And we have to have not just compassion, but we have to do real things to make sure that those people are okay and have what they need, right? So we have to, we have to work for climate change. I wanna to work to shut down climate emissions, but at the same time, I've gotta take action to take care of and have compassion for the people who are being affected because change, change is hard and change affects all of us and, and some of us, get hurt by it and so we have to try to take care of each other and mitigate that hurt thank you um very very much agree with that um we've talked there a lot i think about the connections to others our relationships compassion wider societal issues um and of course there's another relationship in all of our lives as well as with each other it's with ourselves and there's a phrase that i see very often online within our community um, which says something like you can't pour from an empty cup that we can only mm. really reach out to have time for others to connect with others to give to others if we also nurture ourselves and that that, that self-care isn't selfish it's almost essential for us to be the best we can be and to help others how do you see that how do you see that sort of relationship to self and and, and how self-care helps underpin better relationships it's really important i see this a lot in in first responders, in healthcare workers now. And they're just an extreme example that all of us are in that position where if we don't take care of ourselves, we lose energy, we burn out, and we can't do the things out there in the world to help other people. So, but what it means then is, is being really careful to do the things that our grandmothers would tell us we need to do, right? So we do need to eat 
reasonably well. We do need to, to make the time to get enough sleep. We do need to get exercise. Uh, we try, if we can, we try not to smoke. We try not to abuse alcohol or other substances, right? We really do our best to do that because um, it will enable us to help other people. Um, they did this wonderful campaign to try to get older women to exercise. And they found that when they scared older women with advertisements like, you know, about getting heart disease or, you know, bad things happening to you if you don't get exercise, it didn't get anybody to get more exercise. But when they showed pictures of grandmothers holding their grandbabies and say, be there for the ones who need you, be sure to take care of yourself. Lots of people spent more time taking care of themselves. And so it's, it's almost as though what we need to remind ourselves of is who needs us. And if we want to be there for the people who need us, we have, we have to start by taking care of ourselves or we just won't be able to do it. Yes, and we see that a lot in our community. Lots of people who do a huge amount to care for others, but actually often don't uh, spend as much time sort of being kind to themselves. And so I wondered if you had any tips on that, ways we can sort of nurture ourselves more, not in a sort of narcissistic way, but in a way that helps us to be the change we want to see in the world. You, you, you shared that lovely meditation with us at the start, that idea of sort of having a sense of presence of being aware of what's around you as well as the, the, the feelings you're dealing with. But of course, you've studied the lives of many people. They all have had different habits. I'm sure you have your own practices. What are some ideas you could share with us, Bob, about ways we can cultivate that sense of a good relationship with ourselves as well as each other? Yes, yes. And, and you know, the first thing I would say is one size never fits all. So mm. I just led you through a meditation exercise. But for many people, meditation is not is not something they feel good when they do, right? There's no, there's nothing that you need to be doing meditation or you need to be doing yoga or you need to get this kind of exercise or that. What we do know is that if you can find some way to tune in to the bigger world around you, so that could be through prayer, that could be through playing music, uh, that, that could be through uh, painting or doing a sketch. There's so many ways that you just center. Could be writing, writing in a journal. Um, there's so many ways that we can center within ourselves that then energizes us to go forward. And the way to know what works for you is really just to check in with yourself. When you try something, say, do I feel calmer? Do I maybe feel more energized after that? Or do I feel depleted? Or uh, was it unpleasant? And if it wasn't good for you, don't do that. Move on to something else. Find what works. I love that. And it's what I would sort of describe as mindful living. We talk about mindfulness as a practice, but of course, you're, you're really encouraging us to tune in and notice what's going on in us and around us when we do different things and to cultivate those things that help reduce anxiety and increase um, calm and compassion. Um, we, we've sort of uh, getting towards a time where I'd like to bring in some questions from the audience who've been waiting very patiently and raising all kinds of wonderful things while we've been speaking, Bob. The, the, the first thing that's come up a lot while you've been talking is people who are just keen to hear a bit more about your study. So first of all, could you just let us know briefly, where can people find out more about the amazing work you've been doing? Yes. So there are two places. One is a website called lifespanresearch.org. So all one word, lifespanresearch.org. And then there's another, uh, there's another website for the study itself. It's adultdevelopmentstudy.org. Again, all one word, adult development study. And the adult development study uh, has some of our papers, which are, you know, the papers we publish in scientific journals, which are highly technical. And, you know, if you need some bedtime reading to put you to sleep, you might want to try some of those papers. But some of you may want to see the, the, some of the scientific basis behind what I'm saying. So, so by all means, uh, check that out. Thank you, Bob. 
Um, so there's, there's a whole range of different uh, topics that have come up, but I'm going to dive into quite a difficult one, I think, here. So Rachel's raised a question about how can we manage the rejection and hurt that we can sometimes be met with? You know, I guess she's talking about when you reach out to others or try and form a relationship or friendship and you feel rejected or hurt or somebody does something hurtful to you. How can we respond positively and constructively to that? Yeah, that is such an important question. And it happens, as we know, it happens a lot. I mean, there's not one person alive who doesn't know what it means to feel hurt and to feel rejected. We all do. And um, I, you know, I think there are a couple of things to point to. One is to see if you can decenter yourself to think, okay, maybe this isn't about me. Maybe what feels like a rejection could be that this person is just having a terrible day or this person just learned that their father-in-law has cancer or you know things that you couldn't possibly know about. So remember that there are many possibilities for why you get a negative response from someone. Our first tendency is to say, this is about me. And, and you have to remember that very often that's not the case, that it isn't about you. Um, and then the thing is to, I think, to take a breath, to step back, to let the hurt pass, because it will pass. Um, that don't respond right away, don't send the angry text or email in response. It's very tempting uh, to send something angry back. But if you can hold yourself back, don't do that. But instead, take time out, go away, think about it in the way I'm suggesting, take a walk, sleep on it. And the next day, if you still want to respond, see if you can respond in a way that has some compassion. Um, sometimes one, one uh, phrase I like is strike while the iron is cold, that don't go back while the iron is hot, while you're in the heat of passion or the other person's angry. Don't do that. Step away, let everything calm down, see how it looks to you after you have calmed down and then go back to the person who's rejected you or move on. If that's not a person you need to spend more time with, move on to people who, uh, you know, who won't respond that way. Yes, I find I, I learned the hard way that if I receive, for example, an email that makes me angry, it's always better to sleep on it and think about it in the next day rather than <laughs> in the heat of the moment. Um, so there's a couple of questions here which relate to the current situation with the, the crisis and social distancing. So Arjun, first of all, asked, would love to know your perspective on the effects of social distancing on uh, sort of men mental health right now, but also in the future, which is, I think, a really important point. We may be facing a sort of second wave of mental health challenges as much as physical health challenges. And sort of related to that, Gemma has asked an interesting question about um, relationships obviously matter but how important is physical touch? Because of course, at the moment, we're not able to, we can see our loved ones, but we can't hug. I mean, my, my, my sister's given birth to a baby girl, her first baby, my first niece during the uh, lockdown, and I've yet to meet her in person and hold her. I mean, this sort of lack of touch is really hard. So what are your thoughts on the, the perhaps the longer term impacts on our, our health and mental health, but also this question of touch? Right, well, let me, let me speak to touch just briefly because they did some wonderful experiments where they had people waiting for a painful medical procedure or actually undergoing a painful me medical procedure. And they measured their heart rates when they were alone having the procedure, when they were holding the hand of a complete stranger or whether they were holding the hand of a loved one. And as you can expect, the heart rates of the people who were alone were really high. The heart rates of the people who were holding the hand of a complete stranger were lower as they went through this difficult experience and much lower still were the heart rates of the people who could hold the hand of a loved one. So touch is key going through hard times. So that said, you know, that question of what is the effect on our mental health of this pandemic? It's gonna be really important to know more about it. And so what we're realizing is as with physical health, we know that people unfortunately are putting many of their mental health needs on hold. They're feeling like, well, I can't, I can't reach out to a therapist or a doctor. I can't do anything about it. Actually, that turns out not to be true. So the one thing I would say to you is if you are feeling, say, very anxious 
or depressed or, or suicidal, uh, that reach out, reach out for help. That mental health is one of the easiest things to get, to get online, to get help with. So I'm seeing my patients online. I will see two patients this afternoon when this webinar is done. And we've been going right the way through the pandemic. And my colleagues are doing new, seeing new patients online at the hospital where I work. So please don't, don't feel like you have to hold back from getting help. Let yourself get help rather than waiting and waiting and uh, waiting till things get worse. Um, and then what we want to do, of course, is to make more and more help available as we emerge from this pandemic because it is making us all more stressed and more agitated. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you. There's some really helpful advice in there, Bob. Um, I'm going to bring us to a question from Christina now, who says, I work with older people who often live on their own and are currently very isolated. I'm looking to introduce them to mindfulness and meditation. Do you have any advice on ways to do this when we can't meet up? I'm trying to gauge whether physically distanced mindfulness walks might be a way forward, or, or potentially there's other ways of doing that mindful activity mm. in a distance way. Do you have any insights on that? I love that idea of physically distanced mindfulness walks, where you help, you know, show people like mindfully just let's just stop for a moment and look at this tree you know and uh, one of my one of my teachers once said that a, that a great mindfulness exercise was what is here that i haven't noticed before so maybe i'm on a physically distanced walk and i'm looking at a tree that i go by every day but you stop and you pay attention and you ask everyone to notice what's here that i haven't noticed before it's a great way to introduce older people to mindfulness. The other thing is you could try something like I did just now, you know, online, see if that helps. Um, for some people it will help. Um, the other thing you could do, some of you may know the teaching by Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen teacher. Um, he does a, an exercise where you mindfully eat a raisin. And you could probably look this up. I bet it's online. And it's certainly in some of his writing where you could teach. So anyone, any, like an older adult could be sitting there and you could ask him or her to take something that they, that an ordinary thing that they're used to eating, but to really mindfully eat it. And you lead them through the exercise of taking a little bite and feeling what it feels like in your mouth and all the different tastes and, you know, you can imagine going on and on. But that's a way I think, especially for people who get scared of being alone with their own minds, which we can get scared of, especially if we're not used to it, to try something like that mindful walk where you spend three minutes looking at a flower and nothing else, or do that mindful eating where you eat a raisin mindfully. Do something like that with older people and see if it resonates for them. Thank you. Uh, so jumping from older people and that very interesting question to young people. So Sue Roffey has asked, what do you think the role of education is in helping young people learn the knowledge and skills and attitudes they need for healthy relationships? You've talked about how important that is. Obviously, uh, you know, the home environment and parenting plays a big role. But what about education? How can we help young people, especially maybe in the world where they're staring at screens so much? How can we? Yeah cultivate good relationships for the next generation? Thank you for asking that question. That is huge. And, and actually, there's, there's this thing we talk about as socio-emotional learning. And, uh, you know, we talk about it a lot, but, but educators have devoted a lot of time and energy to developing really great programs to teach children in schools at all ages, from preschool on up about feelings and what feelings are like and how to be with them and how to manage uh, arguments and disagreements and how to manage feelings, how to name feelings and manage them. So there are these very, very good curricula that have been developed. In fact, there's a, there's a consortium called CASEL, C-A-S as in Sam, E-L, uh, Collaborative for Academic 
and socio-emotional learning. You can go to their website, C-A-S-E-L, and they will show you all kinds of things that are going on all over the world. Um, and you can see all the curricula that have been developed. And what they find, there's a wonderful uh, big analysis of hundreds of studies that have shown that when they give these programs to children in schools, they don't just do better emotionally and in their relationships, they do better in math class, they do better at reading, they get into trouble less, they get into fights less, they get kicked out of school less often. So all of that is to say that this kind of learning is uh, turning out to be wonderful. And what we have to do is uh, help parents who get worried that we're going to try to take over their children's minds. We have to help parents see that, no, 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 this is perfectly benign. It's not religious. It's not anything. It's just a way to learn about how human beings operate and how to handle all the thoughts and feelings that come up in the best possible ways. Thank you. And I think in, on, on the subject of education and this current situation, one of the things I've observed having our children at home for home learning, first of all, amazing a way of helping all of us parents realize how brilliant teachers are and how hard yes. they are. But yes. also that to see the anxiety and stress that conventional schooling was causing my children, but then in lockdown, a bit more freedom and creativity, and then going back to school now in recent weeks, where actually the pressure feels a bit off. Everyone's a bit more tentative. The days are shorter. It feels like all the good bits of school, being together, a bit of fun, but without quite as much pressure. And I, I can see my kids flourishing in a way that they weren't before. So there's something about our hot housing academic sort of system that doesn't bring out those human values in, in, in many of our young people. Um, I want to bring us back to the study for a second, Bob, because a question that's come up a few times, which I think is really important, is about gender. So obviously you mentioned that this study, because it was set up a long time ago, was focused specifically on men. So maybe you want to say a little bit about how you're trying to rebalance that with the next generations, if that's the case. But also, Caroline has asked a really interesting question. Do you think if it, if it was more balanced as a study and you'd had more men and women as well as men in there, would you have found any different results? So what, what do mm -hmm. we Yes, that is a great question. That is a great question. And first of all, we are constantly apologizing for the fact that our original sample was all, all white men. I mean, how it's so politically incorrect and terrible to assume that this is the way to study adult life. But that's what they started with in 1938. So yes, we've since we've, we're studying all their children when they are 51% female, as it turns out. And so thank goodness. Um, and uh, of course the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren as well. And I think that question is really important. Would we have found different things? So undoubtedly, yes, we would have found some different things. What we have been impressed with studying the second generation is that the similarities between men and women are far greater than the differences. Now that said, there are still important differences. And so one of the things that we do now is I'm, we're very careful to only talk about findings that have been proven to be true for women as well. And when possible, when it's been studied, proven to be true in other ethnic and cultural groups for people of color. Um, because we know that um, white males are not the, you know, that, that what we find in a white male population is not necessarily generalizable to the, to the whole world. And so we're doing our best to change that and to remedy that as we go forward with the research. So well, I look forward to coming back together again in about 75 years where we can uh, get an updated... Uh, in the yeah, we'll be there. We'll, I will look forward <laughs> to it as well. But hopefully, uh, and, and much sooner as well. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions, Bob. I know you, you know, you're very generous in sparing all this time for us, and uh, we promised to wrap this up by eight o'clock our time, three p.m. your time. Lucy's got a great question, uh, Robert. She says, as a psychiatrist, how do the findings of this study inform your work directly with people who have mental ill health? I know you've talked about that a little bit already. Do you want to say a bit more on that? Yes, yes. Um, it's it's such a good question. Um, I think what I've found from studying all these lives is that lives take wonderfully unexpected turns, that sometimes they take negative turns, yes, but that many times people surprise you in the way their lives that seem 
uh, doomed to failure can turn out well and that that surprising things can happen, including for people who struggle with mental illness. And so, you know, actually my predecessor, George Valiant, said something I thought that was very insightful. He said, what goes right in human development is much more important than what goes wrong. Now, I'm not sure that's totally true, but what goes right is very important. And so people who are even struggling with difficult health problems and mental health problems can, with the right resources and the right supports, uh, have good lives and do wonderful things in the world. Which is very good to hear. Uh, thank you. So we're, we're, we're running out of time and I wanted to bring us sort of full circle back to what's really at the heart of our mission with Action for Happiness, which is not just about dealing with our own mental well-being and sort of supporting and nurturing ourselves. It's also this idea of bringing that into the world and to, to sort of create a happier, kinder way of living. Sahar had a really interesting question a bit earlier on saying, how can we gain the agency needed to affect change? With a bit more context, it seems like there's a lot of anger and frustration at not being able to make much of a difference. So here we all are as individuals, there's all these big problems around us, things we'd like to put right. How can we gain that sense of efficacy, agency, purpose to be able to see that we maybe can have this ripple effect on the world around us? Ah. Uh. Yes, I've been asking myself that a lot because there are some things I really want to change right now in the world. And, and I think what I've been trying to do and, and encourage people I care about to do is to, is to think small. When you start to feel overwhelmed by the, the enormity of some of these problems, think small and think about what you can do, what you like to do and what you're good at. So you don't have to do something else that you're not good at, but you feel like you're supposed to do. Just start with what you're good at. Maybe you're good at calling people up. So maybe you do a phone tree about some organizing for some cause. Maybe uh, you lick envelopes <laughs> well. Maybe you, I mean, just anything that you might do. Uh, think about what you do and then see how that, that thing can be brought into the world in the service of the cause you care about in some way because the danger is that we can feel so overwhelmed that we're paralyzed that's that's the big danger not that we will do something too small but that we won't do anything at all so mm -hmm. tune in to what you like what you care about what you're good at and then just find a place to do a little bit more of that in the world what a lovely way to finish, Bob. Thank you for sharing that. That's certainly what so many of us in this Action for Happiness community are trying to do on our own small ways and perhaps in some quite big ways together as well. Um, I'm so grateful for you. We're all very grateful for you joining us. And I've been so grateful to see that the, the thousands of people who joined this call have, have stayed during the, the, the call. I can see the numbers have stayed high throughout. So you've obviously kept people yeah. engaged. Thank you so much for being here and um, just to, to let you know and let the participants know that we will be sending a, a follow-up email around to everybody tomorrow to share some of those links that you mentioned to your wonderful studies and work um, and also before I hand back to you for maybe a final thought before we close just to let you know participants and people in the Action Happiness community our next one of these webinars will be next Thursday with uh, Martin Seligman the founder of Positive Psychology in conversation with uh, our great friend and co-founder of Action for Happiness, Richard Layard. So do join us for Martin Seligman and Richard Layard next week if, if you're around, folks. But, but Bob, thank you so much again for a, a wonderful evening together. Would you, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us before we leave? Yeah, I think just to appreciate this community, to appreciate what Action for Happiness does and, and everybody who participates in it, that this matters. Like, don't for a moment think this doesn't matter. This matters a lot. And that even though the problems are huge, what you are all doing is a, a big contribution to what in my Zen life we talk about as saving all beings. That's what you're about. And I'm so grateful to you all for doing it. Well, so likewise. Let's, let's, um, let's end there. Thank you again. And let's go out and try and save as many beings as we can. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, Bob. And thank you, all of you, for joining us this evening. It's been lovely to see you. All the best, everyone. All right. Bye.